Let this sink in. One in 50 people in England has COVID-19. It's even higher if you just look at London, one in 30. And while that's dominating daily life there, the new normal of Brexit arrived as Britain announced it had inked a last minute deal to exit the European Union to avoid the so-called crashing out scenario. With us now for a closer look in London, UK, there's Paul Waldy. He is the Europe correspondent for the Globe and Mail. Paul, Happy New Year. It's great to see you again. I hope you're staying well. Uh, indeed I am. Thanks for uh, having me on. Not at all. Well, you and, uh, of course, the uh, rest of the people in the UK have just entered, I gather, your third national lockdown. You're kind of the center of Europe's COVID-19 outbreak. How are people handling all this? Well, as you mentioned, just at the top there, the numbers here really are quite frightening. You're talking about levels of hospitalization in particular that are much, much higher than we saw back in March when, of course, the outbreak first hit Europe. Not only are the hospitalizations high, but the death toll is climbing. You're seeing numbers like 1,000 a day uh, of people dying. So it, it's bad and it's getting worse. And really, it's all about this new variant that seems to be spreading far and wide across the country. And the government now is in a desperate race to vaccinate as many people as possible to try and gain some kind of control over this pandemic. I think I said UK's national lockdown. I'm in England, of course. And, and um, well, t talk, talk to us about this variant, because uh, I guess Britain is, has the unenviable uh, title of being the, uh, the locus of this or the birthplace of this new COVID-19 variant. How did they discover it? Well, they came across this back in November when the country, and really it is UK-wide, uh, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland also have similar types of lockdowns now. What happened back in November was the country then went into a lockdown, but cases didn't slow down in Kent, which is in Southeast England. So they went back and started looking at the the, um, the, the work they've been doing on the virus, the sequencing of the, of the genetics of the virus, and they found that there was a different strain of this virus, a different variant of this virus that was showing up in Kent. They traced it back to late September. And it's this variant now that they're saying is up to 70% more contagious. And not only is that a concern, because it has now spread throughout the entire country, and I, and I gather into Canada and other countries as well, there's also a South African variant that has arrived here in the UK that is also highly contagious. So UK right now is getting hit with two variants plus the original COVID that came here in March. Hmm. Let's talk vaccines because the UK government does say that it wants to administer nearly 14 million doses by midway through next month. That's everyone over the age of 70. That would be frontline healthcare workers. That would be social workers who would be at the top of the list. In your judgment, based, I don't know what, on your sense of things, on public opinion polls that have been published, how much faith does the public have in the government's ability to organize the logistics of this? Well, that's going to remain to be seen. And today, of course, they kicked this off by opening seven big vaccination centers in some soccer stadiums, some convention centers uh, across the country. So, I mean, there is some hope that this will get delivered. The government now announced today they vaccinated two and a half million people. That's a million more than they announced just about a week or so ago. So they are ramping it up. Whether or not they're going to be able to meet this target that they've set, which is incredibly ambitious, you're talking about 200,000 vaccinations a day. And lately, they've been running at about 300,000 a week. So it is a massive ramp up, but they seem to be doing it. They seem to be getting there. They're now rolling out the vaccine to doctor's offices, to pharmacies, uh, as well as these vaccination centers, and of course, uh, most of the hospitals across the country. So we'll wait and see. I mean, the government does not have a great track record on managing this pandemic so far, but let's hope that they get the vaccination program right. That's strange that they wouldn't have a great track record on it because of course, Boris Johnson, the prime minister had COVID-19 himself. And I think, remind me, I think he ended up on a ventilator for a while as well, did he not? Oh yeah, he said he was 50-50, he was in intensive care. This was back in April, uh, you know, so he was very serious condition. But the problem the government's had, and I think in fairness, a lot of governments around the world have faced this. They do kind of a delayed reaction to everything. And you know, something's happening and the scientists are saying lockdown, lockdown, or do this, do that. And the government delays and dilly dallies. And Boris Johnson, you know, I guess like a lot of political leaders is all about optimism and all about the bright side to everything. And he's reluctant to sort of bring forth negative news and tell people they have to stay in their houses. So that's been the government's problem to date so far. It's just been inaction or a delay or just a haphazard approach to this pandemic. Okay, Paul, let's pivot now to uh, a section we'll call Adieu EU, because it <laughs> happened. 
Uh, the uh, United Kingdom has now officially left the European Union, and we just want to take a moment here uh, this, um, uh, to, I guess, put, put on the record here some of the changes that are taking place as a result of this deal. Uh, no tariffs or quotas on goods. UK able to set its own trade policy and negotiate deals with other countries. The free movement of people between Britain and the EU is over. Brits will now need a visa if they want to stay in the European Union for more than 90 days. The UK will use its own points-based immigration system, where those abroad must prove they meet certain criteria to be allowed to work in Britain. British professional qualifications, we're thinking doctors and engineers, will not automatically be recognized across all EU countries. And of course, the same goes the other way. Northern Ireland, which has always been a tricky issue here, Northern Ireland will still follow many EU rules to avoid the hardening of their border with the Republic of Ireland. But this means there'll be new checks on goods entering Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK. Okay, let's get to this. For Boris Johnson, what are the major wins for him in this new arrangement? Well, you know, the biggest win, Steve, is that he got a deal. I mean, for the longest time, he was saying, we're not going to get a deal. We might not get a deal. There might be a no-deal Brexit. So he set expectations so low that the fact that he got any a big relief to a lot of businesses and a lot of people in this country. It also fulfills a long-standing ambition of him and other Brexiteers to get Britain out of the EU. It gives them control over their borders. It reduces, it, it eliminates the free movement of people. It lets them control who comes into the country. It gets them away from the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, which has been a big bone of contention for the Brexiteers for a long time, that Britain would not be beholden to a foreign court. So it does fulfill the ambition of Brexit, which was to get Britain out of the EU. He keeps calling it a jumbo Canada-style agreement. What does he mean when he says that? Well, what he would like to mean is that this is some kind of comprehensive agreement, much along the lines of what Canada negotiated with the EU, which was groundbreaking on a lot of fronts. It was a trade deal that the EU arranged with Canada, very comprehensive, that they hoped to use when they negotiate a deal with the U.S. The problem is that the UK-EU deal doesn't really come close to the Canada deal on a lot of fronts. And really what it comes down to is a great deal in terms of movement of goods, which is what the EU wanted. It wanted no tariffs, it wanted no quotas, it wanted goods to move back and forth. It doesn't do very much for services, which is what the UK wanted and the EU didn't want, in particular financial services. So, you know, it's not Canada jumbo or Canada plus, plus, plus they were heard about for a long time and that Boris Johnson likes to keep telling us it is. So if it isn't, why does he keep saying it? He keeps saying it because that is the example he wants to give, that somehow Britain has managed to create a good trade environment with the EU. He also talks a lot about an Australian-style immigration system, which would be a point system. Yes and no. I mean, again, this is going to be in the details of how this works out, but this is not really the comprehensive deal I think that he had hoped for. He now likes, he now talks in terms of, yes, there's going to be difficulties, there's going to be further negotiation on a whole lot of different things going forward. So, you know, that's the other thing, that Britain may have left the EU, but it's certainly, the EU is certainly still going to be a part of Britain's life here because so many things still need to be worked out. Sure. But, of course, they do have a deal, so a deal is a deal, and the Prime Minister is entitled to trumpet that. On the other hand, what are the major losses that the UK is looking at now that they're no longer part of the EU? Yeah, he certainly does need to, to, to highlight the fact that, you know, he got an agreement and, he, and Britain will now be able to go and negotiate deals with other countries. The problem, though, is, again, what this deal doesn't cover, and that is financial services in particular. That's about 80 percent of the UK economy. London, as we all know, is a big financial capital. And up until Britain left the EU, you could set up shop in, in London and service clients all across Europe without any restrictions at all. That's gone now. And how that operates going forward is going to be a lot of negotiation, a lot of discussion. And the EU is going to have a lot more say over that because the EU will decide which financial regulations they're going to abide by or equalize with the UK going forward. So there's a lot to discuss on that. And the EU is going to have a lot more chips on its desk than the UK is. So It'll be interesting to see how that works out. Well, what are critics saying about an agreement that doesn't cover 80% of the economy? How, how good can it be? Well, that is one of the big criticisms of this agreement. Now, a lot of the big financial centers, the big banks and that, have found ways to work around this. But, of course, they are waiting to see where these negotiations go forward will end up. Because right now, the EU is going to get into this debate over equivalence, where they decide which 
of the EQ, of the UK's financial regulations they're going to follow and they're going to abide by. But the EU has its own priorities. It wants to set up Frankfurt as a financial center. It wants to set up Paris as a financial center. So exactly how much they're going to allow London to dominate everything will remains to be seen. They do have a problem in the fact that London is so outsized when it comes to financial services in Europe that really to make life too difficult on financial services could hurt their own businesses. So there's going to be a delicate balance here, but that's going to play out for the next several months. Hmm. Well, OK, this agreement just got signed. And as the expression goes, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Have you been able to see anything actually change in the short time that this new agreement has been in place? Well, I tell you what, the one area where you've seen real problems emerging is that Northern Ireland part that you talked about earlier. Northern Ireland, of course, isn't part of the Brexit deal that was arranged with between the UK and the EU. It's part of a separate protocol. As you mentioned, it was designed to keep the Irish border open. So to do that, they kept basically Northern Ireland in the EU intense, for all intents and purposes as far as the single market goes and the customs union. Well, what that has done is literally created a border down the Irish Sea. So any goods moving between Great Britain and Northern Ireland are now subject to checks. And what you've seen in the ports in Belfast this week is huge delays. Some trucks are being held up for 12 hours. Trucks don't have the proper documentation. Supplies, grocery store shelves literally are empty in parts of Belfast because suppliers in, the, in England have just said, well, I'm not going to bother shipping stuff to Northern Ireland because it's too much of a pain, all the paperwork I have to go through. Imagine shipping something from Ontario to Newfoundland and having to go through customs checks. I mean, that's the situation the UK is in. And they're really worried about this in Northern Ireland. The hauliers are worried about it. The farmers are worried about it. If you're a farmer in Northern Ireland and you want to send some sheep to an agricultural show in England, those sheep have to stay there for six months before they're allowed back into Northern Ireland. That's going to be unworkable going forward. Now, the government says these are teething pains. We'll figure this all out. But folks in Northern Ireland, grocery stores, truckers, transport people are saying they better work it out pretty quick because it's causing real damage now. And we're only, what, two weeks into this thing. Mm. Well, everybody was saying before this happened that it was a key priority for, for as many as possible to keep that Northern Irish border as thin as opposed to as thick as possible. Sounds like in the short run they're having no success with that. Is that right? Well, even more so, what happened is that Boris Johnson, for the longest time, said, no, there'll be no problem between uh, England and Northern Ireland. We're all in the same country. Trade will move. It'll be fine. That's not what's happening. Trade is being held up. There are difficulties. Again, they say they're going to work this out over the long term, and hopefully they will for the sake of commerce in Northern Ireland, but they haven't yet. Northern Ireland, Irish trade's fine because that border is wide open. On the other side, we should talk about UK, EU. Right now, the Port of Dover has always been the focal point of that trade. 10,000 trucks a day, 20% of everything sold in the UK comes through that port. It's been operating okay. Now, why is that happening? For a couple of reasons. One, a lot of truckers haven't sent stuff over to Calais, over to France, because they don't really know what the system is, so they've, they're have they waiting to see what it is. On the French side, they've had a light touch so far. They're not checking as much stuff. They're not enforcing the rules as they could. So we're seeing the flow there you know, moving okay, but again, when that starts to ramp up, when we get into sort of a regular seasonal movement of goods, is that going to continue? And is the EU going to be applying quite the same light touch that it has up until now? OK. Paul, let me get your sense about how united the United Kingdom actually is. Because, of course, we famously remember 5248, I think, was the vote on Brexit all those years ago. Is the country still essentially half and half on this issue? Oh, yeah, very much so. There's been minimal movement in terms of polling on Brexit. You might find now it might go 52-48 the other way, but really the population remains as divided. The folks who support a Brexit back the deal, think everything's going fine. The folks who are against it hate the deal, think everything's going to fall apart. No, the country remains just as divided as ever on this issue. Is there anything that you could see out there that could potentially change the way people feel about this issue? It's going to be hard to say because it's one of these things, it's going to be very hard to measure the impact of this deal over time. It'll take 10 years. It'll take a lot of economic digging around to, to establish what exactly impacted the economy, given the fact that we're in a pandemic, which is going to cause what many believe is going to be the largest recession in the UK in 300 years. It's really hard to know how Brexit figures into that. So I think it's going to be a longer term thing. We might know in the next election when all of these Northern England ridings that Boris Johnson won, if they don't feel they benefited from Brexit, it could be a tougher sell. But we're not going to know that for months, if not many, many years. And again, following up on how united the United Kingdom is, 
Scotland is not all that happy about having to be forced out of the European Union because it's part of the United Kingdom. Can you sort of play out the permutations of what's happening on that issue? Well, this deal has, has been a huge benefit to Nicola Sturgeon and the Scottish National Party. They're heading into elections next year. They're expected to clean up in those elections, win a large majority government. She has been calling for a new referendum on Scottish independence. The polls show she would win that hands down. Now, that's not to say those polls will hold up once a campaign is underway. You recall back in 2014, it went 55-45 against separation. So she does still have a, a, you know, a high hill to climb and also trying to negotiate or trying to sell something that says not only does Scotland want to be independent, but we want to rejoin the EU. That raises a whole bunch of other issues. What do you do with the English border? What do you do with the currency? What do you do with a whole bunch of things? So it isn't a slam dunk for Nicola Sturgeon if she does get a referendum, but Things are pointing a lot more in her favor on that front. Boris Johnson is not well liked in Scotland. He's refusing to grant a referendum. It is something Westminster has to approve. He's saying, no, that's becoming an issue. Let people decide, give people the right to decide. So right now, things are looking pretty good for a referendum on Scottish independent coming maybe next year. Well, having said that, I read in your pieces that Nicola Sturgeon so far has been holding to her view, which is, there's no point in our calling a referendum if Boris Johnson doesn't give it the good housekeeping seal of approval. Is that still her plan, that she needs Westminster legitimacy before calling it? She's saying that, and that seems to be the legal framework that this is a referendum that Westminster has to call. That's what happened last time. There's some people in the, in the SNP who would opt for sort of the Catalan model, where you just go ahead and call a referendum on your own. She's been against that simply because she doesn't think that would work. She doesn't think that would give you the kind of mandate that she would need to sort of form an independent country. So she wants Westminster to, to call a referendum, and she's now using that as a political weapon, saying we're being denied our right to decide for ourselves because of Westminster. So in a sense, it's feeding into her argument. Paul, last 30 seconds here. What do you think people are more exhausted by, Brexit or COVID-19? COVID by far. It has <laughs> far surpassed Brexit as the big issue here right now. Brexit is pretty much forgotten, if you can believe it, after five years of fighting over it. It's been pushed aside by COVID, for sure. Well, we hope you stay safe, and we're always grateful when you accept our calls and come on to TVO and share your wisdom with us. That's Paul Waldy, the European correspondent for The Globe and Mail. Thanks, Paul, and stay safe. Thank you. Same to you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.